So welcome to the last uh, session of the day. We've got Friedrich Wallach from Imperial College London telling us about exceptional algebraids and various related things. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So uh, I would like to talk about the project that I've been working on together with, uh, with Mark Bagden, Andre Hulig, and then Voldram. And so the results can be found in these papers. And uh, right, so, so the title is Exceptional Algebra, it's embedding tensors and Poisson the duality, and I will gradually talk about all those things. So maybe to, to that's the first thing, so let's say that the goal of this talk and also of, the, of that work was to build a framework which would be suitable to understand several things. So for instance, the structure, some structures that appear in exceptional generalized geometry, then also consistent truncations, and also the recently introduced Poisson the duality by Sakatani and Malek Thompson. So, and so the way to do that is that I will want to, I want to build a framework of using some algebraids, and I want to persuade you that that's, that's a good and elegant way to deal with these problems. So as a first thing, let me, let me start with a sort of crash course in, in exceptional generalized geometry. So first, let me say that I will work with exceptional, oops, sorry, uh, yeah, first, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I will work with exceptional groups which have rank less than seven, strictly less than seven. Uh, the reason for that will be that some of the, st like the, the approach that I, w that I will present, it, it sort of, um, there is some problem in extending it beyond, but it's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a doable thing, but it's still like for simple, it's, like we've dealt it only up to that rank. Some, some interesting things happen if you go to seven and beyond, and we are working on that, and you can ask that later, or I will comment on it at the end. But so f for now, I will, I will focus on the case up to seven, uh, without seven, so up to six. So what is happening there is that if you, if you are working with, il with 11 dimensional supergravity or type two supergravity, then the symmetries of, of the theory and the dynamics and the dualities can be neatly captured and encapsulated in terms of some bundles with some extra structure. So for instance, more, more precisely, if you consider this reduction to n dimensions of 11 d supergravity or to n minus one dimensions, then the symmetries of the theory, they are governed in the first case by sections of this bundle. So, so basically you have vector fields, which generate diffeomorphisms, you have two forms and you have five forms. And if you put these things together like this, then there is a nat natural action on the exceptional group. So, um, so the exceptional group, this, this notation, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it means that this is the, this is the split real form of the complex exceptional Lie algebra of rank n. So basically, yeah, okay. So it's just some, abs some abstract thing. And uh, so this is, so the symmetries of the theory are governed by sections of this and, uh, and the, the algebra of these symmetries is, can be described using these brackets you can see here. So you have a vector field, two form, five form, and another such thing, and then you can build an expression which uses only some natural differential geometric operations, such as Lie derivatives, wedges, these insertions, etc. And uh, the bracket has some nice properties. And yeah, and then you can do the same thing for type 2a and 2b, which is rather surprising to some extent. So you, you can find you can the bundle is now more complicated. So it has more summons, you have T, you have vector fields, you have one forms, you have five forms, and you have some other stuff, which is either even or odd differential forms, depending on whether it's type 2A or 2B. And again, the, the, the algebra of these symmetries is captured by some bracket, which I'm not writing down because it's rather long and not that enlightening, but it's just as before it's built out of these natural operations. And this bundle, again, lies in a representation of, of or the fibers of this bundle are represent, are, well, there is, a, there is the exceptional group acting on them. It's actually the same representation, but it's seen in a different decomposition. So, okay, so, so, so far for this, I was talking about symmetries, and then apart from symmetries, this exceptional geometry allows you to, to, to talk about bosonic fields. So the bosonic field content of the theory, of this reduced theory is basically, can be neatly encoded by saying that it's nothing else but a reduction of the structure group from this exceptional, group down to its maximally compact subgroup. So K stands for maximally compact. So uh, if, if you know about the reductions of the structure group, then the same thing happens if you study, say, GR, where you have metric, and okay, if you assume that it's Euclidean for simplicity, then or Riemannian, then Riemannian metric is the same as reducing the structure group from GLN to, to its maximally compact subgroup, which is ON. So this is a precise analog of that statement. And 
just, just as analogously, we can build some curvature tensors out of these generalized metrics, and vanishing of these tensors will, will correspond to the, to, to the fact that these fields, the bosonic fields are on shell. So the story very neatly generalizes the usual story of Einstein-Hilbert action and of GR in this exceptional setup. Now, to be more concrete, and there is another interesting thing that one can do, and that is to study maximally supersymmetry consistent truncations. So we heard about consistent truncations a little bit before. So those are physically interesting things. And what was shown in this paper by Lee, Strickland, Constable, and Waldram is that uh, if you require maximal supersymmetry, for these truncations, then you get that this is basically the same as having Leibniz, what is called Leibniz parallelizations. So Leibniz parallelizations, to break it down, it means that you have a manifold, M, some space, and over it you take this bundle, or, or this bundle, but depending on which theory you're interested in, and you, you demand that there is a global frame such that if you, take, if you take the bracket, then the bracket closes on this frame with constant coefficients. Okay, so what is non-trivial here is that you want the frame to be global, you want it to be compatible with the, with the exceptional group, and you want that the structure coefficients are actually constant. So this is a very strong constraint. So for instance, if you would have, if you would have kind of a primitive version of this story where you would throw out everything and you would just leave with the, with the tangent bundle and with the lead derivative, with the, with the, with the commutator vector fields, then, the, then, one thing, then if you want that this, such a thing is parallelizable, then basically means that the manifold has to be a group or a discrete quotient of a group. So, so this is a very, very constraining condition. And therefore, one natural, condition, one natural question that you can ask is what are such possible spaces that admit these parallelizations? And uh, that's kind of like a guiding theme in this presentation, and I want to show you that how there is an elegant way to kind of settle to some extent this problem if you embed it in a slightly larger framework of algebraids. And, but before talking all of that, I will pass to some simpler setup and I will demonstrate the thing in the simpler setup, and then I will just tell you the result in this case. So in the simpler setup is the one of generalized geometry, where instead of that strange bundle before, you have just the, tan the sum of the tangent and cotangent bundle, and instead of the exceptional group acting on it, you have the O and N group. So this, such a, such a combination, it has an, a natural canonical pairing, canonical inner product, which is given by pairing of vectors and covectors, and the group that preserves it is O and N. And again, just as before, you can, uh, you can use this in string theory. If you, you can see this as encoding the symmetries of the NSNS sector. And the, the algebra of these symmetries is governed by this bracket here. So here, uh, note that here I put an extra piece here given by some chosen closed tree form. Okay, so in, in this context, you can ask the same question. You can ask like, okay, can you define Leibniz parallelization in the same way? So you want to have a global frame which, on which the bracket closes and you want it to be compatible with the group, so in this case it means it's orthonormal. And, okay, so the question is now, what are the spaces which admit such a thing? Can we classify them, can we find them, what, they, what are they? This is a rather, rather simple question with like an answer to that. It's not difficult, but I want it to be like a guiding principle for the exceptional story later. So, okay, so the, an, a particularly elegant way to answer such question is, is now to pass to a slightly more general setup of algebraids. So let me talk briefly about current algebraids. So the proper definition is that it's, it's a mathematical structure which consists of some set of data satisfying some axioms. So there is a vector bundle, which has a bracket, which has a pairing with inner product on the fibers. And there is a, it has a certain map called the anchor map, which goes from the algebraids, from the vector, vector bundle to the tangent bundle. And there is a bunch of compatibility conditions which I'm not listing because if you haven't seen them before, they're not that enlightening. And if you have seen them before, then you know what they are. So you can look them up. It's, the point is that, there it, yeah, there are certain somehow more or less natural conditions that you can put on this data. And, uh, but yeah, perhaps more important than the definition, let me talk about the examples. So as I said, this, this is to be seen as a slight generalization of, the, of this generalized tangent bundle from before. This, this thing. So indeed, this thing is, a, is an example. If you take this to be your bundle, you take bra the bracket from before as your bracket, you take the pairing, the dimensions to be the pairing, and you take the anchor map to be simply the projection onto the first factor. Okay, so this is kind of simple. What is perhaps a, a little bit more extreme example is that if you, if you take the definition and if you restrict to the case where this M is a point 
In that case, the anchor map is necessarily zero, so all is left is a vector bundle over a point, which is a vector space, and a bracket, and a pairing. And if you look, at da look down at this condition, which I didn't write, you will see that the condition is that the current algebra is simply a Lie algebra with an invariant pairing. So such a thing is sometimes called quadratic Lie algebra. Okay, so those are kind of the two most important, at least for the present context, examples of such structures. And now the crucial point is that is this theorem of Pavel Shevera, which says, which shows that there is actually a neat way how to recognize when a given current algebra can be put into a form of, an, of a generalized tangent bundle. And so the the answer is as follows. So you can sh first of all you can show from this definition that any, to any current algebra there is a natural associated sequence which looks like this, where the maps are given by the anchor map and its transpose. And it follows from the axioms that this is actually a complex. So if you, if, you, if you compose two subsequent arrows, you always get zero. And now what Pavel proved is that if you have that, that uh, a given current algebra can be recast in this form if and only if this sequence is actually exact. So exactness means that you know, the kernel of, the, of an arrow is always the image of the previous arrow. Or in other words, there is no cohomology. This is like a one-to-one -one thing, and, it's, and the usefulness of this theorem lies in the fact that, that, sorry, that there are many ways to produce current algebraids, and sometimes, and usually it's not obvious that whether those algebraids are or are not of this form. It's not obvious on the nose, and that's actually where, why the story is interesting, because there are ways to produce current algebraids, and you can show that they are actually exact, which means that they are of this form, and you can relate them to string, to whatever the stringy purposes you have, and if you, if, but if you do that, you will notice that the formulas are kind of horrible and complicated if you want to do it explicitly. Yes, please. Is, is your generalized bundle here always an exact direct sum, or, or are you just simplifying like? Uh, is it always direct sum T and yeah. T star M? Or, or yeah, yeah, but here, I, by generalized tangent bundle, I mean that it's... Locally. No, 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 here I mean globally. Okay. Uh, I mean, this example, uh, yeah, yeah, th there will be a more uh, subtle thing coming to the, with the exceptional case, but in this case, here I mean globally. Okay. That, that's a good question, thank you. Um, okay, so this is the, so we have a definition, we see the two examples, and we see uh, an abstract way how to characterize the first example. Okay, now we can re return back to the, to the question of what are, the, what, were, what are the manifolds that admit such a global orthonormal frame of the current algebra, of the, exception, of the generalized tangent bundle. And so, from this theorem, we see that basically we can rephrase the condition as searching for Leibniz parallelizable exact current algebra rates because we know that they are the same as exceptional uh, generalized tangent bundles. And now it becomes slightly easier, actually. So suppose that, so let, let us see what, what, what does, if we have such a structure, what, what it breaks down to, what are the data that determine, determine it. Determine. So, uh, so suppose that we start with a current algebra, which is exact, and is parallelizable, and also assume for simplicity that the base is compact. Uh, now, one, conse one di direct, direct consequence of such, such parallelizability is that you can write down this vector bundle as a product of the base with some vector space, because in particular, parallelizable means that you have a global frame, so you can trivialize the bundle. And uh, yeah, another consequence of the, of the definition of parallelizability is that you will actually get a well-defined bracket on this vector space. So it becomes a, a current algebra over a point. So it inherits the bracket, it inherits the pairing, and it becomes this thing itself, a current algebra over a point, which we know is the same as a quadratic Lie algebra. So Lie algebra with an invariant pairing. Okay, so we have some Lie algebra. Now, let's go back to the anchor map. So the anchor map, if you remember, the anchor map was a map from, sorry, from, from the vector bundle to the tangent bundle. So in this case, since the, our vector bundle is just product, the anchor map has this form. Now if you look at it, this is basically saying that, that, there is a, that this Lie algebra acts on the, on the, on the manifold. Because if you, if you pick an element of the Lie algebra D, you pick a point on M, then this map gives you a vector at that point, which tells you like, what is the infinitesimal action of, of the group if you would integrate it to a group. So, yeah, so, so it gives you what is called an action of a Lie algebra. But now, we return back to the fact that this is exact. Now, since it is exact, in particular, if I go back, exactness means that, in particular, the anchor map is surjective. So in this, in this context, we have a surjective, or rather transitive, action of a Lie algebra. And it is well known that if you have such a thing, then you can 
and the manifold is compact, then you can actually write it as a quotient of that corresponding group. So this D is a group corresponding to the algebra D, modulo some subalgebra. So it's, you can see it as a coset space. So, okay, so if we, if we go back, it basically, we start with a, with a parallelizable exact current algebra, and you see that it basically corresponds to some pair of the algebras, and actually you can recover it fully from this, from this pair. But now this pair cannot be arbitrary, because again, if we go back, exact current algebraids are those that look like this, basically, by the Pavel's theorem. And those ones have the special property that if you look at the anchor of the row map, that the anchor of the row map is given by this, this, this guy here, by the cotangent bundle. And the cotangent bundle is half dimensional with respect to the whole thing, it's half rank, and also it's isotropic. And so it's half dimensional isotropic, such things are called Lagrangian. So you see that the, the kernel of the anchor map is actually Lagrangian. And because this is simply because it is exact. But if we go to our description in terms of this thing, then you see that uh, the kernel of the anchor map, so the anchor map is just the action of this Lie algebra D on this quotient. And the kernel is, is given precisely by the Lie algebra H. So, so it has to be Lagrangian. So to summarize after this painful discussion, so uh, there was a, if we start with a parallelizable exact current algebra, right, then we can create, then this always gives rise to a pair of a Lie algebra, which is quadratic, it has a pairing and a Lagrangian subalgebra, which is, means maximally isotropic. And such a thing is called Manin pair. And uh, okay, and now, now it is, it is you, can, you can search in the literature about current algebras and you will find that they, this is actually one-to-one. -one. It, it, goes, it goes also in the other way. Okay, so I showed it this way. The other way, it's slightly more subtle, but not very much. And actually, to show it the other way around, so that Manin pair induces a parallelizable exact current algebra. Uh, the thing, you, the, the way you do it is actually that you start with with this Manin pair, you try, kind of try to go back, you go to this space, you build some algebra over it, and then you have to check that it is actually current. And to do that, it's, it's kind of easy to do it from this abstract definition. So in this way, you kind of circumvent the need to working with this t plus t star, to this, this direct sum. Instead, you work with the concept abstractly, and this makes trivial, the calculations kind of trivial. So, so this is why it's useful from this aspect to use these things. Okay, so we have a correspondence between these Leibniz parallelizations and, and Manin pairs. So we basically sort of answered the, the question before. But now it's, it's actually a good, good time to, 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 to pause at this point and to realize that we also have a link, that one can also, in this language, give some insight into Poissonity duality, introduced by Klimchik and Chevera in the 90s. So I, what I will talk about is only a part, like a, the, the simplest setup, so the story is much more general, but in, in its simplest disguise, you can, you can say, and using this framework, that Poisson T duality corresponds to basically having this pair, but having H and D, but having also another H, so having the same D, but two, 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 two possible Lagrangian subalgebras. And the reason, or you can have more, you can have three, infinitely many, it doesn't matter, but the point is that you have more than one. And so suppose that you have two such Lagrangian subalgebras, then what you can do by the previous discussion, you can create a parallelizable exact current algebra, with, in other words, parallelizable generalized tangent bundle over these two sp quotient spaces. And uh, what I, okay, now the claim is that if you equip, if you put some dynamics on them, if you put some dynamic on, so some dynamical quantity, some generalized metric on this Lie algebra D, then it carries over to generalized metrics here and here. And uh, if you use that as a target of, of sigma models, then you can show that these sigma models are dual in, in some well-defined sense. So this is one way to say what it is. So from, from, this, from this perspective of current algebra, it's in this context, it corresponds to basically picking up two Manin pairs for the same, same Lie algebra. And in a special case, if these, if these uh, two Lie algebras are complementary, in general, they don't have to be, but if they are, then at least locally, you, have the, the, you can identify the quotient with the other group and this other quotient with the first group, so, so that your dual space-times, stringy space-times are given by these, Poisson by these groups, which in this case go under the name poisson Lie groups, because they carry a compatible Poisson structure, as was, I think, discussed today already by, by, by Chris. And uh, yeah, so this is where the name comes from, I believe. So, okay, so, this, this, so far this was, the, this was the, ex the generalized geometric case. So you see that you could break it down to basically this statement. And now let me go back to this exceptional story. It, it 
seems that I will finish earlier, so if you have any questions, then go ahead. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so, so in this story, how, how do you go between algebra and group by exponentiation? Do you have to worry about discrete factors? So, uh, so, so the, uh, I, I would worry only here, I think. So, so if, as far as this quotient goes, there, 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 everything is, 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 is works without, without any problems. The problem is if you want to write like explicit coordinate expression or something like this, if you want to, for instance, work on a group, then you have to make this identification. So in doing this identification, you, if you want to really see that it, as living on, the, on these groups, then there, you, there might be some possible problems with like some, some global issues. But if you don't do that, I mean, if, if, if you don't consider the special case, even in general, it's like working on these quotients makes it perfectly well defined. And I even better, actually, this current algebra is, that's maybe a thing I should have said, it kind of allows you naturally to, like, it, it, they, they bring in naturally this, this three form flux, like a non exact version of that. So you automatically get some, like, a, yeah, like you, you can work with non exact three fluxes. They, they just come in automatically in the game. Actually, generically, I think they come. Um, that's that's what happens when you work on these on these quotients. And if you want to make a compact the, a identification with a the group, then yeah, you have to be more careful. I, I hope that's what you were asking. Okay. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I have a question. The anchor map can be understood as a kind of generalized uh, field line or something like that, because it has the structure of one uh, Kirby index. If you put indices over this map, it has kind of one Kirby index and one kind of flat one, it's a kind of relation between, a, or an interpretation of the anchor map as a field by national geometry. Um, I usually don't think of it that way. So w one thing is that usually it's not, I mean, so field by usually wanted to be an isomorphism. You want, and, and in this case, this, this thing is quite far from that, because in, in this case, for instance, it has a kernel given by this, this bit. It, but I mean, uh, I don't know if, you, if it's fruitful to think of it as a field bind. Maybe, maybe it kind of makes contact with this abstract bundle and with what, what is happening on the tangent space, but... Uh, or are you asking more in like relation to, to possibility duality and... and right, uh, right, I, I, I see, I see. Um, we can discuss later, don't you worry. Okay. But yeah, at, at least like from a general perspective, like if written abstractly, there is no clear. I mean, from this perspective, it's maybe not fruitful. But I think I, I think I know what you mean. And uh, um, yeah, so we, maybe in a sense. Okay. Okay. Very good. So so now, if we want to go to the, to the exceptional version of the story, so this is the work that we've done. Uh, we, basically, the ingredients for that can be found in these in these works. Uh, at least that, that's where we drew our inspiration. So basically, the idea is that you can you can build a more general concept than current algebra, it. and this concept stands on, on on some choice of 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 several things, and those things are a group and its two representations. So, uh, so in the O and N case, in the current algebra case, the group was O and N, and this representation E was the vector representation in which the, the generalized tangent space was. <laughs> And this n was a was just one-dimensional space, uh, real numbers. So in, in in exceptional geometry, you want to generalize this to some more general thing, and namely you take some. But 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 it's, okay. So for those of you who work, who know about tensor hierarchy, then I think those two bits are the, basically the first two bits in tensor hierarchy. So this is where you get the representations from. Uh, but like in, in general, to play the to to write down the definition that I will write on the next slide. Is that what you need is just a group and two of it, two is representations, and you want that there, is, there are certain maps between, there are certain symmetric maps between E and N and the duals. Uh, and uh, so, in a sense, you want to see this N as being a generalization of inner product. It's like you have like a couple of inner products. And more concretely, for, for these exceptional groups, the, the, the representation corresponds, the E representation is the fundamental corresponding to the leftmost node, and N is the one corresponding to the rightmost node, if you write them like this. Okay, here is a little, okay, whatever. Um, yeah, and, in the, in, and because the groups we work with are, are all simple and nice, then basically, I mean, these, these two maps, they come out 
automatically they are just projections down to sub representations um, okay up to a scaling okay so so this is this is kind of the data that we need to fix so we fix g to be this group and we fix these two representations e and n and now we can write down the definition so if you remember the definition of current algebra then this is basically i just copied it and changed a few words so exceptional algebra or uh, okay we can also one can also call it algebra for short uh, is a structure given by a vector bundle a bracket an anchor map and instead of an inner product that we had in, in the current case now we have a g structure and since we have a G structure, then it means that you have a principal G bundle behind it, and you can construct the associated bundle corresponding to the N representation. So what I'm saying is that you, if, you, if, you, if you have these things, and you, for free you get a second bundle uh, which, li which corresponds to this N representation. And so here I'm making a little bit of an abuse of notation, because I want that these E and N bundles, they transform in this, in this E and N representations. Um, okay, so you can write down... Okay, if I write like this, it looks very straightforward. There is a little bit of subtlety in, in doing it, but yeah, we figured it out and it's not a big deal. So basically, you can generalize the definition to, the, to this exceptional case. But now, what, what, what kind of makes us sure that this definition is the right one is the following rather non-trivial fact, that there is a way similar to Pavel Shevera's theorem about classification of exact current algebraids. There is a similar way how one can recognize when a given exceptional algebraid has the form of one of these things that they had at the beginning, like this one or this one, because those are the ones that play the, the role of generalized tangent bundles. So kind of the, the, the first result is that there, which we proved in this works, is that there exists a certain natural sequence following from these axioms. It looks like this. It's again, there is the tangent bundle, there is the E bundle, and, but there is something slightly maybe new. And uh, yeah, so we have a different sequence, and the claim is again that from the from the axioms it follows that this thing is a chain complex. So if you compose the two subsequent maps, you get zero. Okay, so th this you can show. This is fairly straightforward. What is less straightforward is actually this, the the this theorem that we proved that actually if you require that that this is in fact an exact sequence. So exactness. So note this subtlety that now we don't have like zero on the left so exactness now means exactness in here and in here okay so basically it means the row is surjective and in that uh, kernel row is image of this so okay so you if you if you dim, if you if you have a an algebra or exceptional algebra which is exact then you have basically two cases one is that the dimension of the base is the same is, is n and is the rank of the exceptional group or it is n minus one and the claim is that if this is so then locally important you can identify the the exceptional algebra with the exceptional tangent bundle for m theory or for type 2b theory so those ones that we had at the beginning these rather long expressions together with the bracket and everything there is a similar thing for 2a which is more subtle because 2a is in a sense non-maximal theory from this perspective so so uh, basically but you can still recover it if you require non like sort of minimally non-exact theory. So you don't want that the cohomology is zero and zero as you would in the exact case, but instead you want that this is zero dimensional and this is one dimensional. And then you can show, and this is a rather messy, messy calculation, but the result is elegant. It just says Friedrich? that it, it, you recover the 2A theoretic. Friedrich? Yes, I, I have sorry. I question. So for Chevera's result, it's also a classific... Uh, um, sorry, I don't... <laughs> So for the normal exact case, it's also a classification result. So here also you have a classification in terms of fluxes because there the, in the normal exact case is classified by three form fluxes. Yes, okay, very good. So, so thank you. Yes, so, so yeah, right. So, so in, in Pavlov's case, so in, in, in the current algebra case, actually the prop, yes. So one statement is that uh, the one I said that if you, you can, a current algebra can be written in this form if and only if the sequence is exact, but actually uh, like a, you can you can go further and you can actually show that the such possible exact current algebra are classified by the third cohomology class of the manifold, because uh, because for this you, because you have presence of this H flux here, and uh, so if you are given an abstract current algebra satisfying that this is exact, then you can always put it in a form like this for some H, but this form is non unique. You can you can you can you can also, using some different choices, you can identify it with this, 
different ages in the same cohomology class. So basically, it only depends on the cohomology class. Uh, and in here, here it's 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 uh, here it's more complicated. So so the proper the easiest way to say uh, to, to say it precisely is that if this is true, then locally. Uh, so basically, there are kind of like two. Sorry, if it's exact, then there are two possible normal forms in which you can put the algebra locally. You can either have the, that thing or that thing. You can still twist them somehow. If you're interested in the global thing, you can still do some twists. Uh, but uh, and but the gluing is kind of more complicated in this case, and it's to me it's not even clear that globally you can you can you can if you have an exact exceptional algebraids that you can globally identify it with anything like this I, already that is not 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 clear to me that that's i mean as a as a bundle not talking about the bracket already as a bundle it's not clear to me that you can write it globally like this in current algebraic case you can uh, because some things are simpler there and in some sense it's some sort of abelian version of the story but this exceptional story is more con more more actually more more interesting perhaps so, so I don't want to. So I'm not claiming anything about the global thing. I, I will tell you about twist on the next slide. But, but it still doesn't answer the question about the, glo the global classification is still a little uh, one step further in difficulty. Okay, there, there is, there is a, maybe a, a caveat here, not caveat actually, a, a beautiful thing that actually I, I said that if it's exact, then you have these two. You can either put it for uh, put it locally into this form or this form. But it's, if it's, if it's at the, it, in these two AKs, there are actually some local moduli that you cannot get rid of because you have some scalar deformations, possible massless deformations of the theory. So I will talk about it on the next slide. So here, in this case, actually, locally, the, the form of the algebra is not unique, but it depends on there is a one or two dimensional degree of freedom left. So let me go into that. So, so fluxes. So if you, if you go through the story, then you, you see, by the way, that this, it gets progressively more and more complex. So in M theory case, sorry, <coughs> I should have said that like the way to prove this is basically to go in the same way as for current algebra. It's you kind of build something, and then you have to show it satisfies the, the, these axioms. So that's where you, you kind of heavily use the, the fact that you are working with some abstract concepts like this. And uh, in the course of that proof, you actually also find out what the possible twists are. So I will let me give them here. So for the M th for the M theory case, you have a possible twist by uh, one form and four form. So just an emphasis: remember that we are working with exceptional groups up of rank up to six, including six. So the manifold in this case it's six-dimensional at most, and in type two it's at most five-dimensional. So that's why you don't have the seven-form flux and these things. Uh, so, yeah, but the, the remaining fluxes are a one-form flux and a four-form flux. So this one is related to the three-form in M theory, and this one is related to the fact that we are we are working with warped compactifications. So those are kind of the things that appear naturally in in the context of this uh, this type of geometry. So this is kind of the, related to the field strength of the warp factor, and there is some Bianchi's that this has to satisfy. What is rather more interesting to me is that is the, is the two B case where where the formalism kind of enforces or shows that the, the, the fields naturally organ or the twists naturally organize into some objects like this, which I maybe it's known, but I, I mean, I, I, to me it was a surprise that it kind of very neatly organized that the twists organize into a flat F1, sorry, flat GL2 connection, a covariantly constant doublet of spinner of three forms, and a covariantly constant five form, but that condition is not here because it's five dimensional at most, the manifold. But it's kind of curious that it, it organizes like this. So if you're interested in how this relates to the scalar degrees of freedom of 2b, then you can ask me. Uh, but anyway, in, in, in the 2a case, it's even more complicated because this, there is less structure to work with. And the case is not, not maximal. It's not exact, but it's minimal and not exact. So the story is more complicated. But in particular, I, uh, the interesting thing is that you have two possible zero form fluxes which satisfy the condition that their product is zero. So one of them has to be zero, at least. If, if you have like a compact, man, a connected manifold, then basically at least one of them is zero. And these correspond to deformations. One of them is the Roman's mass, and the other one is the, is, is the parameter coming from this paper, I, I believe. I don't remember which one is which. <laughs> Maybe you can infer it from, from here. But you see that there is a bunch of, bunch of things. So actually, I can, I can, maybe I can say, 
a little bit about like when when you're trying to to prove this thing that exactness of this sequence Im or minimal non-exactness implies something and something basically the thing you you do is that you build this algebraid and then you are checking the conditions and then you then you discover that actually locally you have the possibility of these twists and then what you do you are trying to use the gauge freedom to to kill those twists and even though i'm not writing the gauge transformations it's kind of a funny exercise to check that you can one by one eliminate them until you in this case end up with zero flux here with zero flux and here with one of these two two guys at the end okay so so this is the story of the twists and now let me let me i think talk about oh yeah the parallelizations the thing I promised. So, so now without further elaborations, I can tell you what the result is. So, I should say that the the the, the result of this part it kind of parallels a result obtained by Gianluca Inverso in 2017, where he used a language a very, like a very different type of language for for obtaining basically these these kind of results. But but yeah. So in in a sense, the, this part of the work can be seen maybe as a as a simplification and maybe maybe slight refinement of his results. So, but what the result is, so the result stated again elegantly in terms of these algebraids is that these exact parallelizable algebraids, or in other words, exact, uh, sorry, or in other words, maximally supersymmetric consistent truncations, they correspond not to Manin pairs, but something that you can call exceptional Manin pairs. And so they are again given by a pair of two things. So there is like, an, instead of a Lie algebra, you get a algebraid, exceptional algebraid over a point, so this is essentially, if you if you if you if you think about it for a second, this is the embedding tensor, like literally, or well, the fo I mean, structure of an algebra over a point is really the same. This encodes the embedding tensor, and instead of a Lagrangian subalgebra, you have a co-isotropic subalgebra, which is a slightly more general thing. And the proper definition of that, if you want, is that uh, it means that if you take the annihilator of v, so. I'm defining what co-isotropy mean. means. So you take the annihilator V. So annihilator is a subspace of the dual consisting of co-vectors which kill your space V. Okay, so this is a well, annihilator. And if you take, if you take any, any two elements in the annihilator and use this map, use this map here, then, the, then you demand that this is zero. So that's the condition of co-isotropy. It's kind of dual to the notion of isotropy. Whatever, it's some condition. And on top of that, there is some two mild conditions that are kind of not present in the current case because they are actually automatically satisfied. So one of them says that the algebra, the, this algebra, this algebra over a point is now not necessarily a Lie algebra, but at least you know that the symmetric part of the bracket has to be in, inside this subalgebra. So this, this co-isotropic subalgebra has to contain all the bad stuff, all these, all these things of this form. And secondly, and perhaps more intriguingly, there is a certain trace condition. Uh, that looks as follows, and uh, yeah, there is some constants in the game. And intriguingly, this condition is always satisfied in the M theory case. I don't know about any direct way to prove that, but it follows from this framework that it's satisfied. Okay, but those are just mild conditions. And actually, in examples that the people usually study, I mean, you won't usually, have, if you have some unimodular stuff, then this is kind of, you know, traces of ads are usually zero. So this is not a big, big restriction. But now you can also also look back and you can you can you can try try to reformulate the the the, the Poisson Liu duality in this language. So in this language, it corresponds as before with Poisson Liu duality. It corresponds to having fixing e but taking different v's inside. And uh, actually, the framework I'd automatically, again using the beauty of these algebraids and of of the compatibility of these structures, you can show that. Uh, Actually, this is automatically compatible with supergravity equations. That follows kind of semi-automatically. You only need to do a little bit of check. Um, right, so that's what we did in the first paper. Um, okay. So, yeah, now let me go to examples. So, so kind of the, the, the most, the simplest class of examples that we have. So first of all, I should say, okay, so if, if if I want to give you an example of such a parallelization of our Poisson Liu duality, basically at this stage it just suffices to give you a pair of these two things. So space with a bracket, this algebra, and a co-isotropic subalgebra of that. So 
the simplest case is if you take the bracket to be zero. So if you take the big space to be abelian, and therefore sub any subspace is a subalgebra. So the only condition, this is this is trivial. This is trivial. The only condition is that it needs to be quasitropic. So if you have a subspace and a quasitropic subspace of that, then this leads to an example always, and the, and the space that you will get, this parallelizable space, it will be a torus. And now different choices of of this subspace are different choices of quasitropic subspaces, if I now want to make a connection with the duality. So different choices of subspaces are related by the action of the exceptional group, and those considered to the kind of dual tori, or u-dual tori, so this is the usual u-duality. Um, yeah, so that, that's the first example. And in the second example, we all, it's, this is kind of a backwards going example, so we already know it's easy to see that any group is automatically parallelizable a Leibniz parallelizable manifold. So this corresponds to Scherk's work reductions, I believe. Um, uh, and, but yeah, if you want to cast it in this form, then you can identify what are these, what is this exceptional Mannion pair. And so it just follow, it just co consists of this, this algebra and this subalgebra. Okay, this kind, this is kind of half trivial. But I'm just saying that you can embed this story of this of Scherk, Schwark reductions or parallelization, consistent truncations on groups into this framework. And uh, what is maybe more interesting is that you can also see what the generalized Young-Baxter deformations are in this case. So they just correspond to the fact that you, 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 take, you fix this E, but you deform this V such that it stays transverse to the first, first, first bit. And, uh, yeah, and then the condition, and the condition for such thing is, uh, sorry, the, the condition for this new subspace to be still a subalgebra is the Young-Baxter uh, equation. So the story embeds like this. Note that in both of these cases, it, you have that the, so you have this E space and you have V sitting inside it and a complement, an actual complement to this V is this K here. So in this case, and also the one above because it's a special case, uh, you see that, that uh, this V has a natural complement which is a Lie algebra. Uh, so this, this, is, this relates to, to, to the thing that Chris was saying before, I think, that, that you, you can have this, like, the first batch of this of this of these generators of of the exceptional Linfield double you can you don't have they don't have to form necessarily a Lie algebra in this case they do but in general they don't I mean in, in, in here you don't have such a I mean yeah here here the only thing you want is that you have this coisotropic subalgebra so it's dual it's it's complement may or may not be a subalgebra and in fact in the next examples it will not be so let me pass to the more interesting examples so you can recover spheres. This is uh, as explained in this paper. In our framework, it, it, in this framework, it, it just amounts to saying that you take the pair of SO5 and SO4. Okay, so SO4 is a subalgebra of SO5. But what is, uh, okay, that's, that's simple, but it, what is kind of non-trivial is that it is a co-isotropic subalgebra. That's kind of the, it, it's kind of the only pair of Lie algebras where this happens that I know. That, that's, uh, yeah, I can, I can be more explicit if someone wants, but yeah. Uh, in this case, it just so happens that that this is a quasi-tropic subalgebra, the other conditions are trivially satisfied, and the parallelization that you get is the one on a four sphere. Um, please, please. Yes? And you're always thinking compact here, I guess, right? When you say the only example. Uh, because you could do trivial yes. other examples by right. taking non-compact real forms. Yeah, I guess I meant compact, thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, right. So yeah, this this gives an M theoretic parallelization. So so you get an exceptional tangent bundle in the M theory sense over this, and you get a parallelization. So you can do consistent truncations on a four sphere. A slightly more complicated example is is, to rec is you can recover the five sphere in the type two B case if you take this kind of algebra. So so the notation by this notation I mean that you have this space SO six plus six plus six, and now the bracket on this thing this exceptional algebra bracket on it is given such that, first of all, this is a subalgebra, so a bracket of two guys in here is the SO6 bracket. Bracket of this and this is just the action of SO6 on this representation space. But uh, on the other hand, if you take bracket with anything in here, that's zero. Okay, so this is central, this is left central. So you see that the bracket here is not skew symmetric because if you take the cross bracket, then it's not skew symmetric because bracket of this and this lies in this, but bracket of this and this is zero. So this is not a Lie algebra in usual sense. I mean, in any sense. 
but still, if you take that and if you take this to be your subspace, then you can again check that this is co-isotropic, and then hence if you integrate it to, a, to groups, uh, then you get a five sphere as a quotient. And okay, so yeah, in this case, is unfortunately there is not much of a duality going on. But if you perform some contraction, if you degenerate this example, the second one, if you degenerate the group, the algebra SO6 to SO5, some my direct product with five, it's called a Wigner contraction or Wigner inner contraction, and you keep the rest un untouched, then this thing will admit to two interesting co-isotropic subalgebras. One of them given by SO4 semi direct product four and the other one is by SO5. And the product and the and the and the quotients will give you a four sphere times R or R five. And those are dual to each other by the previous abstract nonsense. Uh, and they are both to be parallelizable. Unfortunately they are not compact, but okay, what what can one do? Uh, if you want a compact example, still perfect. Uh, still rather maybe a simple hands on example is that if you take the similar thing, you take just SU two plus three, meaning again that this three is central, so bracket with anything in three is zero, and the cross bracket is given by the bracket in he of something in here and in here lens in three. So this is the al the algebra and the, the quasi-tropic subalgebra. You have two choices: you can choose either three or you can choose u one plus three, and one of them results in a three sphere and the other one results in a two sphere. And they are by this argumentation they are Poissonly u dual, and one of them is m theoretic and the other one is two a theoretic. Um, okay, so f so much for the examples. Um, and uh, yeah. Friedrich, can I just ask a question? Here? Yes, please. Um, as you mentioned, when you discussed the Poisson Lee T duality there with the generalized metric, you can construct a SIGMA model uh, where you can define really a notion of duality. Do you have any idea what to construct here so that Poisson Lee U duality is made manifest in some? So no, not in terms of sigma model that I don't know, but but uh, in terms of, of supergravity you can do that. That's yeah. that's 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 what. Yeah. But no, but I don't have anything inter anything intelligent to say about this and uh, how this relates to Poisson to to sigma models, unfortunately. What is the condition that if you take two coisotropic Vs um, and they give the same uh, solution of supergravity after isomorphism after diffeomorphism? Is there some condition like that? Um, well, it, yeah, it, it may so happen that, 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 that they give the same space. Like, for, for instance, the in, 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 okay, in this kind of half-trivial case when you have a torus, you always get, if you, if you take different choices, you always get different tori, but it becomes interesting if you put some generalized metric on it because then, then the resulting torus, if you, if you identify all, all quotients with some given torus, then the generalized metrics will be different. So, in terms of space, I, I mean, well, there is the obvious condition that if you have a, if you if you have a such a quasi-tropic subalgebra and you act with the adjoint action on it, then you will get a space which is the same. But in, in general, I don't think there is a general condition to determine when two such things produce the same thing, at least as far as I know. Okay. So yeah, that's uh, that's it. So. I can tell you what, what more can be done with this. So obviously there is a problem of higher rank. Maybe at this stage I can say, so the problem with this E7 case is that one of the axioms, which I didn't write, <coughs> is uh, no longer satisfied as it, as it is written. So, so the, the, pro the thing is that, uh, so if you know about current algebra, then there is, there is a axiom which says that the symmetric part of the bracket is governed by the inner product of the bracket of, of, on, on the current algebra. And there is a there is a there is an analogous condition here, but that condition is not true in e se, in the e seven case because of some, well, because it's not true. It stuff gets kind of more complicated. So uh, there are different there are other things that you can say. There is a framework in which you can generalize this thing, but then you have to be careful and you have to check whether that more general framework still re, whether you can still recover your exceptional tangent bundles from this condition because that's kind of crucial to the story that you want like the. The, the idea was not to build any generalization. I mean, if you want to any, have gen any generalization, then you can talk about Leibniz algebras. They are very general and they encode all of these things, but the, they are too general. The thing is that you want to have notion which is strict enough so that you can recover from the exactness of this sequence, the tangent bundle, the exceptional tangent bundle. So in the E7 case, this is a work in progress, but yeah, so to how to fit it in this particular framework. And uh, right, and then you can talk about global classification as we briefly touched before. 
And uh, another particularly interesting thing is to deal with non-maximally supersymmetric consistent truncations, because those, as you see here, the, these maximally supersymmetric consistent truncations, sorry, uh, like they, they correspond to, to these exceptional Manin pairs, and this is a super strong condition. So as you saw, the examples are not too numerous. But in the case of non-maximally supersymmetric consistent truncation story is much more, there is lots of, lots more interesting geometry flowing around. So that's, that's one another thing to do. And then you have, you know, usual stuff. You can, do, you can encode, try to put in fermions. You can try to go away from exceptional groups towards some like more general triples of, of, of this data. That's also an interesting thing and, and so on. So yeah, that's, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Friedrich. Um, we've got, again, plenty of time for questions. Uh, so it's related to, to Eric's comment in the middle of the talk. Sorry? It's related to Eric's uh, ah. question. Um, so I was wondering yeah, if how you can derive the geometry related to uh, these uh, theories. So if you have some, so Chris showed us some generalized field bind in his talk, so I was wondering in this in this language, um, how we can extract like a, metri like a metric and, and the tree form and stuff like that. Right, okay, that's a good question. Um, so, so, so in the core and algebra case, um, so, so the, the way that I presented it here is kind of, I find it particularly ele elegant because you don't have, well, it's kind of abstract. Uh, the point is that if you want to if you want to perform some okay so actually the, the difficulty or kind of the the, the non triviality comes from this from this statement because it's because the way you produce these um, how to say that sir um, kind of the, the reason Poisson duality gives such in, uh, relatively complex examples like that you can you can get some pretty wild and interesting spaces is in a sense that that there are two different two different descriptions of, of a current algebra over this over this quotient one of them is the one is the one which is simply you know t plus t star that's the one you weren't explicitly for for string theory but there is another one which comes up naturally if you do follow this construction and that one is kind of uh, that's a picture of where you have a trivial vector bundle over this and those those two are equivalent, but they are non-trivial. There is like the equivalence is kind of non-trivial. So so if you want to if you want to really relate this this follow this construction at the end recover explicitly what the generalized metric looks like, you have to follow that isomorphism between those two things. And there there are ways there are concrete ways which I uh, should probably remember and maybe I can recall. But so so in the current case this is possible, and th there is like a well-defined recipe how you can recover that. In the, but it requires some choices. That's that's important because, because this, that's one one of the reasons why the story is so interesting. That there is no canonical choice. If there would be a canonical choice, it would mean that the story that you get at the end would be kind of simple. But, but anyway, sorry, I'm getting maybe too far. Uh, so so in the current, so the answer will be that in the current case you have a way of of like recovering this these things. And in the exceptional case, there should also be one, but I didn't think of it so far. But they sh you should be able to do that. Sorry for a roundabout <laughs> way to say that. So m maybe maybe this is related. The, the by vector is telling you how to twist the one form piece into the vector piece when when you're making an isomorphism between uh, the double and T m plus T star m. Mm-hmm. Right, and I think that's that's how you see the generalized uh, via bind popping out there. Right, right, being yeah. Being precise about what that isomorphism actually is. That's right. That 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 thing works at at least in the case when you have these transversality. So you have you have so that you have the the group. If you don't have the group, then then I think you then you need to pick some choices, like some connection or something, to make to make it work. Um, I, I have a question, and um, well, I mean, you already mentioned you're talking, you're thinking a little bit about E7, but I was just wondering how different the story comes out to be because somehow 
just from the experience of actually constructing these consistent truncations directly in the exceptional frameworks, in the end, somehow, nothing really changes when you work with E7 and E8 once you plug in certain unsets and so on. Everything reduces to exactly the same examples, essentially, that you showed with the right. spheres. So I don't know whether we've all just missed something, something special that we could have done, or whether once you look at it the right way, it really trivializes and looks exactly like the story you've been telling. I don't know if you've got any insight on this yet. Um, no, but it's also because I haven't looked at it for, for now uh, some time, but yeah, uh, uh, th 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 that's a good point. Like from, from some perspective, the, like it, it going to E7 is not a big step. It, it, it seems very much like a natural thing to do. So it's kind of curious why it seems to break in here. And probably the reason it, that it breaks in here is that, uh, that we are not using the most natural definition in here. So in fact, there, I, yeah, I think we came up with a, with a more natural definition. <laughs> But we haven't yet checked whether whether this property of uh, sorry whether this property of recovering the exceptional tangent bundle whether it still holds. Uh, so yeah, so I I think it probably can be traced to the fact that maybe this is not the although this works and it's beautiful it's it's may, there is maybe a, a more worksy and beautifully formulation that would uh, that would that would make E seven like more in line with the other examples, and also then presumably go beyond. But interestingly, stuff breaks more and more as you go to E8 and, and all that. So that's kind of a nice challenge. OK. And may, may just um, another question, given that you have this slide open now. Do you see any sign of something like generalized type 2b supergravity arising just because you were looking at the fluxes and the deformations and so on? And there's some story, I guess, Mark here has even done a little bit on that. Uh, with how generalized type 2b arises here, like the, yeah, you can. Uh, you mean the one where you don't have a dilaton, but you replace it by. Okay, that, 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 that's a good question. So, 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 so there is a natural way to approach that in the current, from the current perspective, where you can fit it nicely with. So that, that's uh, that was our work with Pavel in a couple of years ago. But that, that's the generalized geometric story. It fits in nicely, actually, surprisingly nicely. I don't know yet how to relate it to the. To this case, but any, anyway, the, the stuff that I, that, I, that, I, that I had here is kind of local, and locally you don't really feel much of a difference between that. So, so, that, but yeah, I, I don't. I, we had some discussion with with then Waldram about this. I, I, I quite forgot, but but I, I don't have a, a good, I don't have anything concrete to say. But it, it's a good question. It should be investigated, and it's on the list of to do things. Okay. Um. Any other questions? Okay, well then let's thank uh, Friedrich again. <laughs> <laughs>